Peace, what's going down? It's DJ Payne One for BeatStars.com. On the line with my man Technology, who's a producer who's been doing a lot of dope stuff for a long time. So if you don't know his resume and his body of work, you're about to. What's going down? Appreciate you uh, joining us tonight. What's going on, Payne One? Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. It's an honor. We've interacted back and forth on social media, but I don't know the full technology story. So um, how long have you been making beats? Uh, I'm going on 16 years. I don't want to say whether or not I'm close to that number, so I'm just going to skip to the next question. What's your DAW of choice? I'm looking back at your screen and I see Reason. Is that your is that your weapon? Uh, a- Ableton, actually. I switch back and forth between that and MPC 2.0. Am I hallucinating? Is there not Reason on that computer? There is. I, okay. I have I have Reason and Fruity and yeah, I. I dabble in a lot, but I use Ableton and MPC the most. What made you try all those different uh, all those different platforms out? I started out on FL um, back when it was just Fruit, Fruit Loops, Loops, yeah. way back in the day. And then I actually won an, a machine from, I, from an iStander battle I did a very long time ago. And after that, I kind of made the small transition to hardware. Um, learned and learned and learned and then as the older machine came out and the new machine models started rolling out i decided to upgrade a little bit went to ableton um had a push for a little bit broke just kind of stuck with the hardware and the software got my the mpc studio and i've been working on pretty much those two primarily for the last two years so so are you are you running the mpc studio in the traditional way yes Okay, what well, I'm curious why because you know you could just MIDI slave it to your DAW and basically do the same thing. Is there a sonic difference? To me, there is. Just the way the stock plug now the Ableton tens stock plugins are ridiculous, so it's it's not really a a factor now. But I've been running the MPC through Ableton now, but back when I was on Ableton nine, it was just too much to load all the VSTs at the same time of loading the software and the hardware and running everything at the same time. It was kind of killing my computer usage. So when 10 came out, it was just a game changer for everything. So it just made things a lot easier on that front. All right. So within your 16 year career, at what point did you decide to start selling beats online? About three years ago, Mike Trampy and I have gone back many, many, many moons. And um, I was trying to, make the transition from consciously attempting to blindly email stuff and not get anywhere and the traditional producer frustration to actually make it the transition to beat stars and online platforming and online branding. It actually changed a lot from the traditional hustle and bustle to going out and studio hopping and what I was doing before going to every festival to finally having a platform, having a full feature website beat store where everyone can just check out the entire catalog and do what they need to do from there. And it's not that I haven't stopped building relationships since then, but it's made those relationships a lot easier to form online through a beat store. In my opinion, you've done the label runs, you've gone those traditional routes what have you learned about selling beats online in terms of how it differs from you know jumping from studio to studio going up to to new york you know getting meetings with anrs the beat marketplace is worldwide you can literally get any beats to anybody in any country at any time during the day doing it effectively and from a lot of of what mike has taught me from what beats everyone at beat stars has pretty much schooled me on is you know, tracking who's coming, tracking who's going, tracking everything that, you know, customer wise. And even if they're not buying anything, you know, send them a quick little message or an email like, hey, I noticed, you know, you were browsing such and such a beat off of such and such a time. You know, if I give you a promo code, would you buy it? Nine times out of 10, they're not going to stop you with a promo code. But then because you hit them up directly, you're kind of in a sense building that relationship with the artists or anybody who's coming to your page and building it that way whereas like even if you were going the traditional route before it was very hit or miss now people are actually attracted to you like 
you're the brand, you're the market. So having them come to you is a lot easier in that aspect, especially when you know who's looking for what. A big thing that a lot of uh, Beat Stars producers have emphasized to me is upload schedules. What's your uploading schedule like? 110% honest, last few weeks hasn't been great. But usually um, one to two beats a week, I do the beat, mix it down, get everything scheduled, do the artwork, do the video on the same day. Schedule that I usually do is called Technology Tuesdays. So every Tuesday, there's one to two beats that you're going to expect from me every single Tuesday. Um, if you've been visiting regularly, I notice you've been visiting regularly. You sign up for the email list. I'll send you a promo code and toss you just because you've been there every Tuesday listening in how it goes. But it's good to stay consistent, um, especially even if you're just starting out, if you're getting a few beats up once or twice a week. It helps build not just your catalog, but it shows people that you're actually investing time in your craft and building things in that as well. So the consistency is definitely key with being successful, definitely in online beat sales. Okay, so so this um, goes without saying, rest in peace, Mac Miller. We see the kids' desktop in the background. Yes. And you produced his record, Traffic in the Sky. Yes, I did. And he actually claimed that that was his favorite track off of that tape. Yes. Uh, how, how did that relationship start? How did you meet Mac Miller and how did that record get recorded? So back in 2010, um, I was working with a, uh, a rapper slash R&B artist known as Scala. He's out of Detroit and his manager is actually um, J.I.D.'s current manager uh, over at Dreamville. He had a good relationship with everyone at Rostrum and in the Pittsburgh scene and Mac had literally just come off of you know, the song Live Free and Kool-Aid and Frozen Pizza kind of jumped off and Nike's on my feet jumped off. And he was like, you know, Tech, you should shoot Mac a couple beats here and there and I'll send you his email. Back when AOL Instant Messenger was a thing, you know, I had Mac's screen name. We hit it up. We chopped it up a couple times and I sent him like a, a batch. A couple weeks later, he's like, uh, yo, I'm putting on a music video. You should probably check it out. And the music video was Traffic in the Sky and Don't Mind If I Do um, that he put out. And that's how I kind of found out that I was on Kids. And he was like, this, you know, this mixtape's about to be huge. We're putting out the rostrum. And, you know, I was very thankful for um, for Barry and for Scott for hooking me up with Mac and, and building that relationship and helping me guide through that. Um, and for everything that that song has personally done for me. Um, it was featured in a couple different clothing ads. Um, it's currently being played at the uh, Pittsburgh Penguins games. And, you know, a lot of different opportunities have come to me thanks to that. Well, congratulations on, on the eight year anniversary of that tape. And um, evidently, it's gone diamond on thatpiff.com, which means it's been downloaded a lot of freaking times. Yes, almost two million from the last time I checked. What was the process of creating that beat like on your end? The sample originally, I I am a big anime head. So I used to go back and download like tons and tons and tons of anime soundtracks. And, and when I heard that specific sample, I ran with it. I, I was like, this has such like a vibe, like it was so wavy. And the way I flipped it at the time, like, the, if, if you listen to the track now, there's like a clap. There was a snare in there before. There wasn't any tams. It was literally just the sample and a kick and a bass snare. And when I went and changed it, you know, Mac had actually asked me if I could add like one or two things to it. I did so, you know, not thinking, you know, whatever. Fine. Yeah, okay. And um, the beat you know, was relatively quick to make and I wasn't even thinking anything of it, added it to a batch and the rest was literal history. Let me let me ask you this because this has come up a lot, especially with producers like uh, Curtis King. Uh, I had this conversation a little bit with Jay Reed. Do you find that your simpler beats that are that are straightforward in terms of you know, layers and not having too much going on. Do those do those tend to inspire rappers to want to rap more than 
kind of the overproduced records, I kind of fall in that trap sometimes myself. Uh, you're laughing a little bit. Yes. I go in sometimes, you know, um, Dr- Dream Life and I have collaborated on, on a couple of jams recently. And a lot of what I want to do with the record is like, man, this would be a smash. And I'm going to add like a thousand drums and the break line is going to be this and that. And it's never that simple. Even if you cut out a little bit, you know, look at the process of like what Dilly used to do or like what Knife does or, you know, producers like that who literally could be just a sample, a kick and a snare. And people jump all over it. So if you're, it also depends on the lane you're going in. If you want to have like a rapper rapping on it or you want to make like a, like a song, yeah, the simpler the better because even then if you want to have someone come and play instrumentation on it or change things up in the long run, it makes things easier being simple. But if you're going for like the trap sound and you know the rolling hi-hats and the 808s all over the place and all the noises and bells and whistles, then that could be your lane and that's how that goes. But yeah, this I believe in my whole thing, the simpler the better, a lot simpler the better. So the two other artists that you've worked with that uh, many people have heard of are Rhapsody and Chevy Woods. Uh, tell, me, tell me about that. What'd you do with, with those two artists? Rhapsody, I met Rhapsody um, at an A3C conference one year, um, same time I met um, pretty much the whole Jamla squad, uh, Actual Proof, Sean Bug, and and the whole camp, Sky Zoo, shouts to all those folks. And Rap introduced me to Charlie Smarts and Tab One of Cooley High, and they were like, oh, should all like do some records together and whatever. I'm, I was like, yeah, okay. They were all based in New York at the time. And when I made the trip to New York for CMJ, we kind of linked up. We all sat down in my hotel room, went through a gang of beats, and they picked one. It kind of ended up being like a small little cipher type deal in the hotel room. And they're like, yeah, we'll take that back. We'll take that back. We'll write to it. And, um, and Rap recorded her verse first. Um, it's actually the last verse on the track, but the whole group came as a collective and, and, and really put it down on, on that one. That one was, uh, was definitely a good, a good vibe to make for that one. Um, when you're talking the simpler, the better, that's definitely one of the simpler beats I did. Um, Chevy kind of came along the same way as the Mac relationship, only I met Chevy, um, through a New York producer named Rodney Hazard. We, um linked up at a CMJ one year and um you know we just build and I ended up linking with them and I met him and Wiz at one point um at a South by Southwest thing we kicked it for a while and Chevy ended up recording the jam at South by Southwest it came out and that was pretty much a dope one too um being around in that atmosphere and you know especially when Pittsburgh was really on the rise at the time and that atmosphere really helped build the vibe for that one as well it was definitely two awesome records Back to Pittsburgh, uh, Mac Miller had an artist named Chew Jackson who you did some work with as well, correct? Yes. How did that happen? So Chu and I, um, I used to produce for Chu's rap group called Fresh Money um, way back in the early 2000s. I introduced Chu and Mac um, to each other because Mac was just starting the most dope imprint and he wanted to grab a couple folks to see who gelled with what. And I suggested Chu to him because Chu was always like he still is always a very hungry artist and wants to, you know, make as much music as he can. And at the time I was just, you know, throwing beats out, throwing ideas out when we were working and he was kind of giving me the same lane for what his his first debut mixtape on Most Dope, um, it's called Beer Flavored Pizza. That came out um and I had produced the one track that's on it. Was actually supposed to have a Mac feature, but they didn't get it recorded in time. But when they went on tour and they did everything together, they did a couple shows in uh, Atlantic City that I was great to be a part of. And they it, Mac knew all the words to the song. Mac was a hype man for the song, and it was definitely um, awesome to know that something that was so simple off of a regular basic relationship and building over the years ended up being something where. Your music gets played in front of sold out crowds and people know the words and you know one of the biggest artists coming out at the time knows the words to your songs and is the hype man for that so 
building off that was definitely dope. It introduced me to a lot of the remaining artists that were on most dope at the time. Um, you know, shouts to Yamza and the Come Up Boys and, and all those folks that were there. But that definitely opened the lane for Pittsburgh to get blown wide open. So let's let's talk uh, producers. I'm fortunate to know a lot of legendary producers. One of them is Rock Wilder. I've been fortunate to do a couple of events with him. And you know him as well. I do. And you work extensively with his son. I do, yes. What's, what's um, that situation about? A different and funny situation at the same time. Um, I met Rock at a, another producer event in Boston. And I had actually, you know, came in like second or something in the competition. And he pulled me aside afterwards. He said, Tech, you know, you got to send me a whole gang of stuff like tonight. And I'm like, all right, Rock, I'll, I'll get you some stuff. You know, I, you're just kind of whatever. And um, I sent him like a folder. Time goes by, time goes by. It's cool, whatever. And um, probably a month and a half goes by, and I guess he was scrolling through his Instagram feed, and he, one of my beats caught his eye, and he called me. It had to have been 2 o'clock in the morning. Tech, tech this, this beat, what's this beat, what's this beat? I'm like, it's free, it's available, you want it? He's like, send it to me right now. I'm like, all right. So I sent it to him, and I sent him a couple beats, and he was like, Yo, you know, I'm doing a, uh, I'm producing a whole joint album for my son. And I was like, no, I had no idea. And he's, All right. So he linked me with his son and um, sent him three or four beats. And uh, his name's Papaya Sauce. He's a very dope MC. He's, um, think, uh, think Hell Rail when he was on Dipset on steroids. And, um, mm, yeah. you know, he's, he's very, very different in that lane, but he's very... Um, very hungry as well and to have my sound accompany with rock sound on on his project is definitely out of this world as far as that aspect so it's still a work in progress there's a lot of james being gone through but i'm very happy to be able to work with uh with the legends you know family and keeping it in the family is definitely hip-hop so we've talked about your beats and your projects and all this music for the people who are watching this, they might be getting antsy to, to, to hear some of it. So where do they hear your music? Where do they go online to browse your online beat catalog? How do they follow you on social media? So on BeatStars, you can check out my page. It's techbeats.com, T-E-C-K, beats.com. Um, full catalog's up on there. I'm on Spotify. Uh, pretty much every streaming outlet that you can think of is on. I'm on there. Um and soundcloud youtube um just search technology ri and you'll be able to find me everywhere um got a lot of stuff in the works a lot of stuff coming um especially a, a solo debut project that i'm producing myself so it's definitely a lot of different surprises in the works okay so if you don't want to be caught off guard by these surprises you'll definitely want to follow my mad tech on yeah. all social media platforms listen to his catalog get in tune with it appreciate you for sitting down and, and taking your time to uh, explain your process and tell your story man thank you of course thank you for having me paying one appreciate it yes sir much continued success to you we're chilling right now technology producer traffic and this guy off kids you know what i'm saying that shit is my favorite jam off kids probably yours too